Hey, hope you're doing great and welcome to the Bikers Podcast, where we explore the latest biking trends and techniques to help you optimize longevity and health span. I'm your host, Teemu Arena, and today's topic is ketosis, one of our favorite states to be in as biohackers. Ketosis is a metabolic state that occurs when the body burns fat for fuel instead of using carbohydrates as the fuel source. Ketones are produced during this process, which have various beneficial metabolic effects, including fat burning and reduction of inflammation. Usually the body prefers to use circulating glucose or carbohydrates as a fuel source, but in the absence of glucose, the body switches over to ketones from fats. This is why the ketogenic diet is such a great tool for fat loss. Ketosis is what the body naturally enters in a fasted state. However, nutritional ketosis happens when the ketogenic state is activated by reduction of the intake of carbohydrates in favor of fats in the diet. Therapeutic ketosis, on the other hand, is reached when the ketosis has lasted for a while. This usually means that blood levels of ketones have reached at least 3 millimoles per liter. This typically requires a diet where at least 85% of the calories are from fats, while nutritional ketosis is already achieved when 65% of or more of the calories are from fats. Carbohydrates still need to be reduced in favor of protein, meaning that 5 to 10% of total calories in ketogenic diets can come from carbohydrates. This usually means something like 50 grams or less of carbohydrates in a typical daily diet. Therapeutic ketosis leads to various metabolic adaptations that may improve brain metabolism, restore mitochondrial ATP production, decrease reactive oxygen species, reduce inflammation, and increase neurotrophic factors to regenerate the nervous system. Our presentation today is from Dr. Jeff Wolek, who is a professor in the Department of Human Sciences at Ohio State University. He has studied a wide range of outcomes of ketogenic diets, including its use in diabetes, cancer, neurological conditions, and performance applications. As of 2023, Dr. Wolek is investigating the use of ketogenic diets in brain metastasis. Dr. Jeff Wolek is the co-founder of Virta Health and serves as its chief science officer to help, for example, diabetic patients to get off or reduce their intake of diabetes medications. The company is extremely successful in doing this. This amazing presentation on ketogenic diets on humans was recorded at Biker Summit 2018 in Toronto. After the presentation, I will share with you some of my top recommendations for practicing a ketogenic diet including how to avoid the keto flu, what electrolytes to use, why not worry about cholesterol levels, and when you may want to practically do a cyclical ketogenic diet instead of doing a strict ketogenic diet. But first, let's listen to what Dr. Jeff Wolek has to say. Thank you for that warm introduction. Certainly a pleasure to be here. The title of my talk, The Human Response to Nutritional Ketosis, really sums up the obsession I've had the last two decades of my life as a scientist and really wanting to understand how do people respond to an intervention that elevates their ketones. And it's been a fascinating journey. So I'm gonna take you with me and share with you some of the highlights and where the emerging research is going in regards to ketosis. I'm a professor at OSU now, and we are performing studies primarily dietary intervention studies that induce ketosis. And our primary method of inducing ketosis is to actually feed people. So we have a metabolic kitchen, we prepare food and feed various clinical populations, healthy populations, military populations, and study a wide variety of outcomes. The interest has just exploded. The last couple years has seen a resurgence in the interest in ketones like never before. So my approach today is to really provide some basics on ketone metabolism and definitions around ketosis and nutritional ketosis, and then talk about some of the targets, which include diabetes and prediabetes, and some of the more emerging areas such as cancer, various neurological conditions and disorders. There's even applications here for athletes, and specifically, we're very interested in how we can enhance warfighter performance and the health of our military personnel. So just quick history on ketones. If you studied physiology in college, you were likely taught that ketones were toxic byproducts of fat metabolism. And the reason for that is ketones were first discovered over a century ago in the urine of uncontrolled type 1 diabetics. And that negative connotation has been really hard to shake. And it's only recently that we're now understanding that ketones are not toxic. In fact, 
based on the current research, we're describing ketones as super fuel and longevity metabolites. But the obsession with you know maligning fat and demonizing ketones has really been part of the fabric of the dietary guidelines and what we promote in this country. But the dark ages of ketones is coming to an end. And in many ways, I would describe the condition now as the golden age of ketones, where we are now making discoveries around diabetes reversal, around new mechanisms of ketones. They're not just an alternative fuel for the brain. They're actually signaling molecules. They have hormone-like effects. We're seeing keto-adapted athletes, not just finishing races, but setting records. And we now have various methods of inducing ketosis through exogenous ketones and ways to promote longevity. So let me just give you a real basic primer here on ketones. So ketosis is really a highly evolved, highly conserved process. And fundamentally, it's a way for humans to fuel their brains. And the problem is we store our majority of our fuel in adipose tissue and the brain can't use fat in that form. So we had to evolve an alternative pathway, which is really what ketosis is. So when we're breaking down adipose tissue, releasing fatty acids at a high rate, and those fatty acids are taken up by the liver and essentially exceeding the liver's capacity to oxidize those fatty acids, we have this pathway by which they can be converted into ketones. And this occurs primarily in the liver. So we're converting those fatty acids, partially breaking them down into smaller molecules called ketones. And our two primary ketones are beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. They're four carbons. And unlike fatty acids, long chain fatty acids, these ketones can in fact be taken up by the brain and used as fuel. So that's how we use fat for fuel in order to ensure a stable fuel source for the brain. And once they're taken up, they're oxidized and converted back to acetyl-CoA and generate ATP. And we actually knew all this metabolism 50 years ago. George Cahill in Harvard performed cutting edge research studying starvation ketosis. And it's true, if you're consuming carbohydrate as a primary nutrient, your brain depends on glucose as an energy source. It needs about 150 grams of glucose per day just to function normally. But if you're in ketosis, and Cahill showed this with very invasive arterial venous different studies across the brain, looking at healthy adults who had been starved for up to four weeks, and showed that the brain can extract up to two thirds of its energy from ketones, dramatically reducing its glucose requirements. That metabolic knowledge has been available. We just really haven't taught healthcare professionals this. When we're distinguishing different states of ketosis, concentrations really matter a lot. So it's important to understand you're all producing ketones right now, no matter if you just ate a bagel or a muffin, your liver is still producing ketones, albeit at a very low rate. Now, when you restrict carbohydrates for most people to say under 50 grams per day, that metabolic machinery starts to kick into gear and you will see ketone levels increase by an order of magnitude from say 0.1 millimolar all the way up to one, perhaps up to three or four millimolar. So that's a tenfold increase. And that's the range we call nutritional ketosis. And while that is an order of magnitude higher than what you would see in the carb fed state, it's actually an order of magnitude lower than what you see in ketoacidosis. And that is a dangerous, life-threatening situation. So when we get into nutritional ketosis, we consider that an optimal range of ketosis. And when you stay in that range for several weeks and months, the body fundamentally goes through adaptations to maintain near-perfect interorgan fuel exchange. And this is a process we're continuing to unravel and understand on a deeper level. But we know fundamentally what happens when you're keto adapted is you become very proficient at burning fat. Your rates of fat oxidation double. And that's true if you're a type 2 diabetic or if you're an elite ultra endurance athlete, you will essentially double your rate of fat burning. So again, we knew all that. We knew most of all that for decades. What's newer in the science of ketosis over the last six, seven years 
is the understanding now that beta-hydroxybutyrate in particular is a potent signaling molecule. We worked out a lot of the mechanisms here. For one, it's a potent histone deacetylase inhibitor that is a primary way in which we upregulate expression of genes. It also inhibits other pathways in cells that are related to inflammation and oxidative stress. But we now understand ketones in the range of nutritional ketosis not only provide fuel, but provide a signaling stimulus. And for example, we now have ligands for ketones that inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome. And this provides a mechanism as to the anti-inflammatory effects that are quite commonly observed with ketogenic diets. And there were actually two separate groups working independently on longevity experiments that started about three years ago and both published their results simultaneously in cell metabolism about six months ago. And interestingly, both studies found more or less the same thing, that mice fed ketogenic diets not only lived longer, but had an expanded health span. So they lived healthy longer. They functioned physically better and cognitively had higher levels of neurocognitive performance than mice not in ketosis. And they worked out a lot of the mechanisms. And it turns out, in terms of anti-aging anyway, a lot of the same underlying mechanisms that we've uncovered with caloric restriction are mimicked by ketones and ketogenic diets without the caloric restriction. Now we have various methods of inducing ketosis. So traditionally, the ketogenic diet was the primary method of promoting endogenous ketone production. And when you restrict carbohydrates and follow a well-formulated ketogenic diet, your liver puts out about somewhere between 50 and 100 grams of ketones per day. And now we have exogenous ketones or ketone supplements in different forms. And this has really just been a new area that's been discovered in the last couple years. So we're really just scratching the surface in terms of what we know about exogenous versus endogenous ketones and how they may work additively or synergistically. And so I won't get any further into this today in my talk, but this is a really exciting area to understand how various methods of inducing ketosis affects organ health and various aspects of well-being. So I would be remiss if I didn't at least have one slide on the practical aspects of a ketogenic diet. So there's a lot of misconceptions and, and misunderstanding around a ketogenic diet. It's uh, what it constitutes and really how easy or how difficult it is. And what I would describe it as a highly pleasurable diet as opposed to one that's very restrictive and barbaric and impossible to sustain over the long term. It's actually quite a pleasurable way of eating. And it's more than just restricting carbohydrate. That's certainly a big part or a big principle of the diet, but it's important to get protein in the right range. It's not a high protein diet. It's not a high meat diet. In fact, protein at high levels is anti-ketogenic. It's important to understand that the quality of fat is very important, if not more important than the quantity of fat. So embracing saturated fat is very important. It's a preferred fuel on a ketogenic diet. There's a lot of nuance and a lot of art to actually formulating and implementing ketogenic diet in people. But once you understand those, it's actually a very sustainable way of eating. And we've proven people can stay on these diets over months and years and decades. So let's talk about some of the clinical targets and most amendable applications of ketogenic diets. So first of all, now, hopefully Canada is doing better than the U.S., but in the situation's pretty dismal. Right now, two out of five adults in the United States are classified as obese, and almost three out of four are obese or overweight. So that's the new normal in the United States. We have a really serious out-of-control situation. And when you look at the prevalence of diabetes and pre-diabetes, over half either have diabetes or are on the fast track to developing it. So again, staggering figures here, and unfortunately, they're not getting better. Things are continuing to deteriorate. Yeah, and we have really good evidence around ketogenic diets for weight loss. And this is probably the most well-studied, one of the most well-studied aspects of ketogenic diets to the point now we have systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And this is one of the more recent meta-analysis 
that shows ketogenic diets are superior to low fat diets for weight loss. So this is not, you know, my opinion. This is now an area where we have a critical mass of evidence to support the use of ketogenic diets. We've done dozens of these types of trials. If you look at the individual responses, the average weight loss is greater than any of the individual weight loss trajectories in the low fat group. And I'll just point out, because many experiments, they don't explicitly ask participants to restrict calories. It's ad libitum or, or to satiety. And yet people naturally restrict calories when they are focused on inducing ketosis. So this is really a, an important attribute of the ketogenic diet. And this is just an example of various biomarkers that res how they respond to a ketogenic diet. So especially those markers related to insulin resistance and, and metabolic syndrome clearly respond in a more favorable way than low fat diets. So the dyslipidemia, the insulin resistance, the glucose, the insulin levels all respond better to a ketogenic diet. Actually, saturated fat levels in the blood go down on a ketogenic diet, which really seems paradoxical because people are consuming two, three times more saturated fat in their diet. And of course, we've been told you have to reduce saturated fat in your diet because it contributes to heart disease, right? But really, it's what's important is if you're accumulating saturated fat. And when you're on a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, you may be taking more in but your body's promptly oxidizing it, converting it to CO2 and water. And if you're not accumulating it, there's no harm. I mentioned earlier, there's consistently anti-inflammatory effects observed with ketogenic diet, pro-inflammatory cytokines and inflammatory markers all improve more on a ketogenic diet. And perhaps most striking, I've been involved with long-term study in type two diabetics in a trial of 262 type 2 diabetics that put on essentially a ketogenic diet combined with a novel remote care model. And the results are nothing short of extraordinary. We're told that type 2 diabetes is a chronic, progressive, irreversible disease. Yet we can normalize hemoglobin A1C levels while we're getting people off medications, not adding medications. And they're losing significant amounts of weight. And people can stay on these diets. We had an 83% of our participants active in our program at one year. And we haven't lost too many more at two years either. So with the right care model and the right information, people can stay on these diets and actually become not diabetic. They do not have the diabetic condition. Now, I won't say we've cured them per se, but as long as they're in ketosis, they don't have elevated blood sugars and A1C levels, and they're off all diabetic medications with the exception we tend to keep them on metformin. So really, the data we have now, it's pretty clear. If you think about the insulin-resistant phenotype and all these various biomarkers that associate with insulin resistance, they all tend to go in a worse direction the more carbs we eat in our diet. And the more we restrict carbohydrates, especially when we get down to a ketogenic diet, the more robust all these markers improve. Now, at what carb level does any given person start to exhibit diabetic symptoms? That varies a lot because we all vary in our level and degree of insulin resistance and carb tolerance. But I think this continuum exists within each person, and it makes a lot of sense to find what level of carb tolerance works for you where you don't have elevations in a lot of these biomarkers. So diabetes is where we have the strongest evidence right now. We have a lot of published clinical trial data and it just makes an enormous amount of sense from a pathophysiologic state where diabetics are carb tolerant. So why do we recommend they consume half their energy from carbs? It's really insanity. But I want to talk to you a little bit about some other targets where we don't quite have the same level of evidence, but there's certainly a lot of excitement and a lot of footprints in the sand that are leading us to think that we will at some point in the near future have the evidence. One is cancer. A lot of cancers, a lot of tumors rely on glucose as a fuel. Tumors often don't have fully functioning mitochondria, so they rely on glucose and glycolysis as a way to metastasize and grow. 
Um, and there are other reasons why restricting carbohydrate and ketosis may benefit certain types of cancer, which is part of the reason that we're very interested in studying this at Ohio State. So here are just some of those reasons. Some of it's purely metabolic, which is what I just described. If you can decrease glucose flux, which is exactly what a ketogenic diet does more potently than any other intervention I can think of, including drugs, you could essentially starve the tumor and nourish the rest of the body. But there's also a lot of evidence tumors flourish in an inflammatory type environment and the anti-inflammatory effects of a ketogenic diet would deter growth. And there's a lot of evidence that we're improving just a lot of markers of patient well-being. I want to share with you an ongoing trial that we have at Ohio State because most of the data we have right now in cancer, there's tremendous interest all over the country and the world, really. But the data to date are primarily preclinical. So we have primarily animal data, as well as small human studies and case studies. But a lot of it's shaping up very nicely. So what we're doing at Ohio State is we're starting with breast cancer, in particular, stage four metastatic breast cancer, enrolling these women who are in pretty bad shape. The median survival for a newly diagnosed patient with metastatic breast cancer is about five years. I'm sorry, the five-year survival of these patients is about 20%. At that point, the care is primarily palliative. So we're enrolling women with newly diagnosed metastatic breast cancer who are on their traditional chemotherapy is generally the standard treatment approach and putting them on a ketogenic diet over a six month period. It's a slow recruiting study, but the patients we have are highly motivated where they're able to induce ketosis. I was just showing you a quote from one of our patients here who says, I'm so glad I participated in this trial. The study team have taught me a new way of eating that is healthier for me and many ways aside from any effects it may have on my cancer treatment. My most recent scan showed that my liver metastases have regressed and are almost undetectable. And we actually have the proof behind that to support that. So we're measuring the actual tumors using the standard sort of floral deoxyglucose uptake method. And we happen to have the most sophisticated PET CT scanner in the world at OSU. It's a fully digital photon counting machine. And we're doing some very advanced dynamic type imaging. For those of you not familiar with this, you're essentially infusing a sub-physiologic dose of glucose tracer that is detectable by the PET scanner. And any organ that takes up glucose at a high rate, such as a glucose avid tumor, would show up on these scans. Now you can also see the heart or the myocardium and the brain also take up glucose and show up dark on these scans. I don't have a lot of data to share with you at this point in time, but we have finished multiple patients. And I can tell you that all patients right now that our past three months in this trial have shown at least a small to moderate to large, in some cases, regression of their tumors. So the evidence is looking very promising and encouraging for cancer. I would say the most work going on right now, there's probably at least a dozen trials going on with brain cancers and gliomas across the country. If you just look up studies in clinicaltrial.gov, it's definitely an area to stay tuned on. And I suspect in a few years, we're going to have a lot more human data to be looking at. Neurological conditions. Again, a lot of interest here. We have really solid evidence in epilepsy and seizures. In fact, we've known that ketosis is very effective at minimizing or eliminating intractable seizures in kids. We've known that for almost 100 years. And it's in fact now more or less considered a standard treatment for many kids and adults with seizures. And part of it really goes back to our understanding of brain metabolism. The brain actually prefers ketones over glucose. If your ketones are elevated in the blood, the brain will take them up in direct proportion to the concentration. And that's why you see this nice linear relationship between blood levels of ketones and brain uptake. And this is regardless of glucose levels in your blood. So if ketones are there, the brain will preferentially take them up. Now to get a significant contribution of ketones, you do have to get them up to pretty high levels, higher than probably what you can get on a ketogenic diet. If you wanna get half your brain energy requirements 
you need to have ketones up in the four to five millimolar range. But if you think about the exogenous ketones, here's a potential application where you can see ketones up in the four to five millimolar range where you're providing the majority of energy in the brain from ketones. You may think, well, what if I combine the diet with exogenous ketones? Would that allow the brain to be functioning better on ketones? And this really is the big question. If the metabolism science is pretty well worked out, if you have elevated ketones, the brain will take it up. The bigger question is, so what? If the brain's running on ketones, is it more efficient, less efficient? Do you have better cognitive functioning? Well, here's what we do know. Your brain's running on ketones. You're very likely protected from seizures. If you have epilepsy or there's ongoing work in Navy divers that also experience seizures because of the high oxygen levels underwater. We also know that you're profoundly protected from low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. And this is really important. If, if you're a type 1 diabetic, hypoglycemic episodes are one of the major risks of being a type 1 diabetic. But also if you're an athlete hitting the wall, that's hypoglycemia in the brain or an energy crisis in the brain. And time after time, we hear keto-adapted athletes talk about being bonk-proof. They don't hit the wall. Hypothalamic inflammation and inflammation in the brain is fundamental to a lot of neurodegenerative diseases. And we're increasingly seeing evidence that various neurological conditions benefit from ketosis. Similar to the story with cancer, it's a lot of preclinical data now. We don't have large clinical trial data yet. But we do have quite a bit of evidence suggesting that neurocognitive performance is enhanced when individuals are in ketosis. And I won't go through all these studies, but if you're interested in this area of research, there's about a dozen references that show in various animal studies and in even human studies that ketosis improves various aspects of neurocognitive function and performance. We're seeing some really provocative work in Alzheimer's. So it turns out Alzheimer's disease is actually a metabolic disease, much like diabetes, in that it's associated with impaired glucose uptake in the brain. And that, for that matter, that's true for most neurodegenerative diseases. There's a hypometabolism in the brain. Now, what's interesting is there's some recent evidence showing that although glucose uptake is impaired, in Alzheimer's, and it's even impaired in mild cognitive impairments, so decades before clinical signs of Alzheimer's, but ketone uptake is normal. And Stephen Cunane from Canada is actually doing the cutting edge work in that area, showing that Alzheimer's patients who are just in moderate ketosis are showing you can essentially make up for that energy gap with ketones and then turn that's associated with improvements in clinical uh, signs of the disease. And Alzheimer's is a huge problem. It's not just a debilitating disease for the person and family members and caregivers, but it's an incredibly costly disease in terms of healthcare expenses. And we have a big interest in traumatic brain injury as well. There's a lot of similarities in, in terms of the hypometabolism and impaired glucose uptake in TBI. And this ties into our interest with the military, where a lot of our soldiers are coming back. Up to a quarter of soldiers deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq come back and have signs and symptoms of TBI, and that increases their risk of depression and psychiatric disorders. So there's a lot of interest in how ketosis might minimize or attenuate some of the secondary damage associated with TBI. And in fact, we have some proposals out if funded that would study parachute jumpers, because it turns out during training, these jumpers, when they land in the impact, about 15 to 20 percent of them develop signs of mild traumatic brain injury. And we think that if we can provide them ketones before they jump, that it'll offer some neural protection for them. So let me talk a little bit about the sports and athlete implications, especially how it relates to military applications. So this is really the world turned upside down for athletes because we've been told you have to eat carbs before, during, after exercise. You got a carb load, that carbs are an obligate nutrient. And it turns out that's totally not true, that you really can think of carbs more as optional, not obligate. And you've got a lot of really pioneering athletes out there, especially in the ultra endurance world, who are proving that concept. 
So here's three really top athletes, two on the left, ultra distance athletes. And in a more traditional sport, the Tour de France, you have Chris Froome. And all these athletes are attributing their success to a low carbohydrate approach. And these are some athletes we've studied in the lab, and both with a military background. It's essentially, they describe this as a transformative experience for them in terms of enhancing their readiness and resiliency and performance in the military. And that's a big reason why we think we should study this. And it's trickling into team sports. I would say soccer and rugby is, are two of the sports that have embraced this the most. And right in my own backyard, the Columbus crew I've been working with for the last four years, and they've really changed the culture slowly there to a point now where they are really getting good buy-in and compliance with the low-carb diet. They're convinced their athletes are healthier, perform better, they recover faster. We were interested in studying athletes who were at the cutting edge here of adopting low-carb ketogenic diets and performing well. So we've conducted this study about five years ago now, and we've published a couple papers on this. It was a rather simple, straightforward study. We just wanted to recruit a group of high-level athletes to come to our lab and go through a pretty comprehensive battery of tests, invasive tests. They included muscle biopsies and infusing tracers and collecting urine and feces and stool samples. We were like hunters trying to maximize the, everything we could and learn as much as we could from these really elite athletes. And we're still sorting through all the data. We did all types of transcriptomic and metabolomic analysis. But I'll just share with you, arguably the, the most striking result here was their extraordinary ability to burn fat. As I said at this onset, one of the basic adaptations to ketogenic diet is you double your rates of fat burning and here's the data. And so these high, the high carb control athletes, their level of fat oxidation, that's a really high level. They're really good fat burners at 0.7 grams per minute, but the fat burning in these keto adapted athletes is literally twofold higher and it's 50% higher than the highest rates ever reported in the literature. So they literally shattered the fat burning ceiling. And when they run for three hours and we measure their contribution of fat and carbohydrate to energy expenditure, they're burning almost 90% fat. So there's just a very low level of glucose oxidation happening. And what perhaps is one of the more striking and surprising results for me was that when we measured their glycogen levels, despite the fact they're eating very little carbohydrate, they're almost exactly the same as their high carb counterparts. So you really have to scratch your head. How in the heck could you have normal glycogen levels and resynthesize glycogen during recovery when you're not eating a lot of carbohydrate? And the short answer is you become very efficient at processing and conserving any glucose that your body has. It may be broken down into lactate. Lactate can be converted back to glucose and glycogen. So your body is highly conserving those glucose molecules and preserving glycogen. And the reason I had the picture of the sled dogs there is because there's actually data, the Iditarod sled dogs, they've done some really nice studies, me metabolic studies on these dogs, and they're the most impressive athletes on the planet. Uh, they also conserve their glycogen while thriving on a very low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And they're running 100 miles a day for nine or 10 days during that race. It's pretty extraordinary metabolically. So just like the population, the military has a real obesity and diabetes problem. In fact, the recent statistics are showing it's a crisis, a national security threat, in fact, where two thirds of soldiers are considered overweight or obese. They also have a lot of sleep disorders. So they're, as described in that article, fat and tired. But this was a white paper on military eligible young people age 17 to 24. And almost three out of four of those people were ineligible to join the military if they wanted to because primarily of their lack of fitness, which is primarily uh, related to obesity. So we're in the process of studying military populations. And our first prospective study of this was in a group of Army ROTC cadets at Ohio State, where we put them on a ketogenic diet for 12 weeks and basically just asked the question, can we improve any outcomes that would be relevant to the soldier in terms of enhancing their readiness? This is unpublished but we randomized 15 people to a ketogenic arm and we had 15 people in a control high carbohydrate arm. We had a couple women 
And we were successful in getting them into ketosis, which is not trivial because a lot of people would argue you can't get mostly college age kids into ketosis. They're drinking too much beer and eating too much junk food. But we were able to do that with a high degree of compliance. And what was really extraordinary here, this was not a weight loss study. We did not prescribe calories, but yet every single person lost weight, not a small amount of weight either. This is almost 16, 17 pounds across the 15 people. And they lost fat, they lost visceral fat by MRI, and they did all of that. They improved their body composition while they're adapting to this training program and improving their strength and power and military specific type tests as well. And we took biopsies, their mitochondria were more efficient. And just like I showed you with those athletes, they did a pretty good job at conserving their glycogen despite being in ketosis. And so I'm showing you, really, I think these are the only three studies ever published in humans that studied glycogen levels in people on ketogenic diets. The first was Finney, and he only had these elite cyclists on a ketogenic diets for four weeks, showed all glycogen levels that were cut in half. This tank study that I just showed you, we had at 10 to 12 weeks, it's 14%. The faster athletes that we, I showed you completely conserved glycogen, they were on a ketogenic diet for almost two years. It was 20 months on average. So some adaptations to ketosis take several months, maybe even years to fully come to fruition. And this is a quote from one of the participants in the tank study who had quite a favorable response and who was also a master sergeant in the military. And he really wants to take the message out to all the military, and he lost 23 pounds. And this was a person that was pretty lean actually to begin with, but still lost all fat, actually gained a little lean tissue. So if you're not excited about ketones and ketosis and all the various ways they can improve health and performance, I'm not sure how to get you excited because there's just so much emerging research and encouraging research being done in so many areas right now that this is a really promising area that we need to make more people familiar with in the healthcare arena and just general consumers, because there's still a lot of misinformation, a lot of defensiveness by people in the healthcare industry against ketones. And yet this is probably one of the most powerful tools we have to promote health. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jeff Wallach, for the comprehensive presentation. Next, I will share with you some scientific-based tips on what to consider when you are getting on a ketogenic diet. Number one, it is good to realize that a ketogenic diet leads to significant weight loss, particularly in the first few months of following the diet if you've never done it before. This is often because you first drop the excess fluid in your body. One of the main mechanisms of this is that the body stores carbohydrates in the form of glycogen, which is bound to water. When you reduce your carbohydrate intake significantly, your body uses up the stored glycogen, which leads to loss of water weight. Additionally, when you eat a high carbohydrate diet, your body produces insulin, a hormone that signals your body to retain the sodium. This in turn causes your body to retain more water. When you switch to a ketogenic diet and reduce your carbohydrate intake, the insulin levels will decrease, leading to a decreased amount of sodium retention and subsequently a loss of water weight. In addition, a ketogenic diet can also lead to an increase in ketone production, which can have a diuretic effect, meaning it promotes the excretion of excess fluids from the body. Number two, on a ketogenic diet, the body excretes more electrolytes, especially sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium through urine. This is due to the diuretic effect of ketosis. This can cause an electrolyte imbalance leading to something called keto flu. Electrolytes are minerals that are essential for the proper function of nerves and muscles and for hydration as well as maintaining the body's acid-base balance. The symptoms of keto flu include headaches, fatigue, dizziness, nausea, and irritation. To prevent keto flu, it is important to consume adequate electrolytes and minerals, especially sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. This can be achieved by adding electrolyte-rich foods, such as dark leafy greens, nuts, seeds, and avocados to the diet, or by supplementing with electrolyte and mineral supplements. I will give you some suggestions in the end of this podcast. Number three, chronic inflammation is a contributing factor to many chronic diseases, including heart disease, cancer, and nervous system-related diseases. 
A ketogenic diet can reduce inflammation in the body, which may help reduce the risks associated with such diseases. By reducing carbohydrate intake, ketogenic diets can help regulate blood sugar levels, making them particularly useful for people with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetics. A ketogenic diet can lead to a significant decrease in HbA1c, a marker for long-term blood sugar control. A ketogenic diet can also improve cognitive function, particularly in older adults with mild cognitive impairment. This is thought to be because ketosis lowers neuronal inflammation and provides an alternative fuel source for the brain in the form of ketones. For a regular healthy young person, a ketogenic diet can provide stable blood sugar levels, improved attention, and faster reaction time. Number four, despite being high in fat, ketogenic diets have been shown to improve markers of cardiovascular health, such as blood pressure, triglycerides, and cholesterol levels. In other words, cholesterol from the food doesn't really automatically lead to increases in cholesterol levels in the blood. The weight loss and metabolic effects can actually improve cholesterol levels. You may experience increases in cholesterol values in the beginning, but a reduction and improvement of the values in the long term. Number five, it is generally recommended for women to avoid practicing a strict ketogenic diet for an extended period of time. The main concern for women is the potential impact on hormone levels and reproductive health. Studies have shown that a very low carbohydrate diet may disrupt normal menstrual cycles and decrease fertility in some women. Additionally, prolonged carbohydrate restriction may cause a decrease in thyroid hormone levels, which can negatively impact metabolism and overall health. If you're pregnant or breastfeeding, have a history of eating disorders, or experience irregular menstrual cycles, you may want to reconsider practicing an overly strict ketogenic diet. Instead, you should look into trying a cyclical ketogenic diet. This means that for five to six days per week, you consume a regular ketogenic diet, which includes less than 50 grams of carbohydrates per day. Then for one to two days per week, you increase your carbohydrate intake to around 150 grams per day. I personally recommend a cyclical ketogenic diet to anyone, including men and women, who have reached their target weight and body fat percentage. This is psychologically also more sustainable, as you can then eat whatever you want one to two times per week without getting fat or changing your body composition for too much. If you want to get your hands on some high-quality electrolytes and other essential tools for your ketogenic diet, check out our website at biohackercenter.com. So biohackercenter.com. Personally, I use a product called Ketokamu Super Fish. It is an unflavored electrolyte mix. What I do, I add it to a carbonated water that I make at home from filtered water to remineralize it and provide me the electrolytes I need. It includes all the essential electrolytes in the form of a sea mineral extract called concentrates. This deep ocean floor extract has electrolytes in an ionic form, which means they are more effectively absorbed and utilized by your body. In fact, concentrates contains over 70 minerals and trace minerals, including all essential ones for a ketogenic diet, for example, magnesium, potassium, calcium, and sodium. It also includes OptiMSM, which is a form of dietary sulfur that supports healthy joints, skin, hair, nails, and it has also shown to reduce inflammation. So check out biokercenter.com and sign up to our newsletter to get 10% off from your first order. That's all, folks. Stay in ketosis and see you next time. <laughs>